is Mark Fries from the NASA Johnson Space Center, speaking on the carbon dichotomy of Mars versus the Martian moons, an important clue to Mars's history. Go, Mark. All righty, thank you. So um, I want to talk about uh, carbon in the Mars system. It's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, there's kind of a dichotomy in the in the Earth Moon system where the Earth has all the carbon and Mars and the Moon has very little. Uh, it's backwards on Mars, and I think it's interesting. I want to talk about it. This is going to be kind of a cat talk. I like to it's basically I'm going to put up everything I know about this and just kind of fast it around like a cat. So <laughs> you can I can um, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So no serious points. I'm just going to talk about stuff. So. Mars surface is one of the most carbon depleted surfaces in the solar system. You know, depending on uh, how you like your uh, Mars surface uh, uh, um, uh, uh, composition, it, it's the, the, the visible surface of the sun has something between 10 and 10,000 times as much carbon as the visible surface of, uh, of Mars. But then there's Phobos and Deimos in orbit which have carbon-rich surfaces to the point that they are some of the some of the darkest objects in the solar system. So, like I said, it's backwards from what you see on Earth. Um, now, I'm going to try to show that uh, uh, carbonaceous infall is an important factor in uh, the uh, uh, carbon budgets of all these surfaces, and, and yet uh, all, all three of them are sitting in the same uh, flux, in the same infall flux. And they're residing in similar, not perfectly the same, but similar radiation environments. And yet we have this dichotomy. And uh, it's, I, I kind of like this because it's a good way to look at carbon as a way to uh, uh, pry into the history of a, of a system or a, of a body. So like I said, car Mars surface is strongly depleted in carbon. We know that because we've landed there. Uh, Vikings 1 and 2 and Mars Science Laboratory brought bo all brought parts per billion sensitive instruments, uh, parts per billion sensitive to organic, uh, to carbon species. And uh, they, their measurements basically range from below detection limit to the low parts per billion. And what they do found, is, this is uh, organic, light organics I'm talking about now. And what they did find is heavily chlorinated and chemically degraded to the point that you really can't tell where it came from. It's carbon. It's on Mars. It's telling its origin beyond that is, is, is more than we can say at this point. Now, uh, there are several sources of, uh, con of discussion about uh, a ref a re more refractory um, uh, uh, carbonaceous material on Mars. And... Uh, they include, uh, there's a, a, a abstract by Jen Eigenbrode et al. from 2014 where she says that the SAM instrument says that there's a refractory carbon there at the PPB, PPM level. Uh, I should stop and define that. Uh, re by refractory carbon, I mean uh, reduced species, uh, larger than uh, basically PAHs and macromolecular carbon. Uh, we haven't used the term macromolecular carbon yet today, so let me define that too. It's basically all carbon species between amorphous carbon and polycrystalline graphite. That's the way I look at it. And it uh, basically uh, sums up everything but graphite, diamond, light organics, that sort of thing. So uh, the refractory carbon in, this, uh, in the Martian, uh, the measurements made on the Martian surface may include uh, uh, malitic acid has been proposed uh, by Benner et al. 1999. He, he said... Uh, 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 malitic acid is basically a PAH that's heavily oxygen functionalized. It's, it's a kind of a uh, intermediate product as you're degrading PAHs away with, uh, as you're oxidizing uh, PAHs away. And uh, he, uh, based on his calculations in his paper, he said there could be 500 ppb to 500 ppm carbon. Uh, and also, uh, Applin et al. says that there could be oxalates running up to 700 uh, ppm, depending on various things in the paper. I'll let you read that. Uh, I think the, t the upper ends of that are a bit extreme, you know, 0.7 parts per, or 0.7 weight percent, 0.5 weight per percent would probably be optically visible. But it's totally reasonable, I think, that there is some refractory carbon in there. So here's, here's what the literature has to say about it. And this is, the refractory carbon is coming from both meteoritic infall and native organic species found in uh, Martian igneous uh, rock. So in any event, you know, the, the total carbon at the Martian surface is probably uh, as high as hundreds of parts per million at most. And then we have Phobos and Dima. 
where uh, the surface carbon is measured by reflectance spectroscopy. So I put that in there basically to make the point that our measurements are coming from only the visible surface of the body. Uh, their spectra are claims, reflectance spectra are claimed to match that of C, D, or T type carbonaceous asteroids, depending on the author. Uh, the D type is a close match to the Tagish Lake meteorite, which, you know, as an example of the amount of carbon we're talking about, uh, contains about, uh, around about three and a half weight percent carbon. But regardless of type, Phobos and Dimos are interpreted as carbon rich to the multiple weight percent level. So the surfaces of Phobos and Dimos contain at least an order of magnitude more carbon than the Martian surface. And I think that's probably a conservative estimate. There's definitely a dichotomy there. Now, and uh, yeah, this is to, just to point out that uh, uh, the uh, uh, carbon infall is going to be a significant part of the modern flux, the modern uh, surface of uh, surface carbon budget, and, but, but, but there's more to it than, than, than just the, uh, oh wait, sorry. The minimum that can be said about that is that the oxidation flux on Mars exceeds the infall flux to the point that uh, carbon doesn't build up on the surface. There's very little carbon left on the surface, uh, but there's more to that story when it's poked into it. So what I've been playing around with is uh, coming up with a carbon cycle for just the Martian surface. I don't really care about the interior. What I want to know is what are the fluxes and sinks involved in what a landed mission on Mars is going to, to, uh, to come across. Uh, I'm a co-I on the Sherlock instruments, and this is, this is of interest to me. And starting with, we can start with a carbon cycle for the Earth. This is what this is here. You see all the various uh, fluxes and, and sinks of a carbon moving away, moving around through the, through, through the Earth. Um, now, Mars, okay, so Mars has no plate tectonics. We have little evidence that there's been significant uh, volcanism in the, over the, beyond the past 10 million years or so. So we're going to just drop uh, volcanism as a, as a major uh, player in this uh, uh, carbon cycle. Um, there's uh, no biota, we can talk about that another time, but there's definitely not a thriving biosphere on Mars that would play a major role in its carbon cycle, and there's no ocean. So what we get is, we take this fairly complicated terrestrial carbon cycle and can simplify it to something like this, where we have uh, regolith, the uh, carbon at the, at the Martian surface, uh, it's uh, you get uh, uh, overturn of the of the surface regolith with the crust to some extent. Uh, there is oxidation, oxidative loss of any carbon in there to the atmosphere, and there's infall of material for dust and meteorites. And I highlighted the dust and meteorites to point out that even though on Earth the uh, infall is a relatively small player in the total carbon budget, on Mars it turns out to be a a, a significant uh, factor. Do the same thing for Phobos and Dimos, and it's a little different. It's definitely simpler. There's no atmosphere to oxidize your uh, your, your carbon to, but uh, impact uh, ejection may be a more significant factor. On Mars, you have to kick things clear out of Martian gravity well. It's much simpler on Phobos and Dimos. The loss of carbon by impact by uh, 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 cratering events may be significant. At this point, that hasn't been examined very closely. So dust infall, it dominates the mar modern mar Martian surface carbon input. Um, and Phobos and Deimos, regardless of their origin, we're going to go into the discussion of where Phobos and Deimos came from here in a second, but uh, they differ from asteroids. They look like asteroids, but they differ from asteroids in one very important way. You know, asteroids floating out in the asteroid belt receive a, a very small dust influx because they're small and they have you know, very little in the way of gravity. And those are the two factors that basically funnel dust down, down onto a, a planetary surface. But Phobos and Deimos, although they are small, they're sitting down in Mars's gravity well. So they receive the, flux, the infall flux that uh, is, is focused onto the surface, uh, onto a Mars. Um, there been a, there's a really good paper here recently, France Deva et al. 2018, she summed up the previous uh, calculations on infall flux onto Mars, and they range from uh, 0.71 to 2.96 times 10 to the 6th 
kilograms per year of uh, falling dust onto, onto Mars. If we just use a simple assumption that uh, the surface ratio area of uh, Phobos and Deimos versus the Martian surface uh, gives us an estimate of the amount of material falling onto those bodies, uh, you know, we can do it more complicated than that. It's probably worth doing it more complicated than that. But just as a simple, you know, cat toy ver uh, version of playing with it. Uh, and Phobos receives 8 to 32 kilograms of dust per year, and, and Deimos receives 2 to 10 kilograms per year. It doesn't sound like much, but Phobos and Deimos have been sitting where they're at for a good 4 billion years or so, probably more. So let's say 4 billion years. And if we're treating this dust at a constant rate, which is a very conservative estimate, the dust flux almost certainly was much higher in the past. But just, you know, um, <laughs> Andy Rifkin, it's pretty funny. Um, uh, over the course of four billion years, Phobos would accrete a two meter thick layer of IDP, and Deimos would accrete about three meters. Uh, with regolith gardening, now let's assume that basically the car their reflectance spectra becomes dominated by carbon when you reach the two weight percent mark. And that comes from a paper by uh, Haroy and Peters, 1991, I believe. Um, anyway, the time to accumulate 2% carbon, 2 weight percent carbon on their surfaces uh, is 155 to 650 million years for Phobos and 110 to 440 million years for Deimos. That's assuming that the dust is coming in at a steady rate and the regolith is growing with impact gardening at a rate consistent with what we see on the, on the moon. It's just, again, these are just uh, simple estimates. Basically, what we see is now, that only accounts for you know, 4 to 16 percent of Phobos' current age and 3 to 11 percent of Deimos, which implies that it is, first of all, reasonable to expect that the carbon infall onto these worlds is a significant player in their reflectance spectrum. Second of all, you know, it also says that Stickney Crater is actually young on the scale of, of, of these numbers because it's, uh, it hasn't been completely covered with uh, a regolith, a dust layer that looks like the rest of Phobos yet. Uh, this assumes IDP density at 1.6 grams per cubic centimeters and 10% carbon and a moon-like gardening uh, rate. So, um, yeah, this can, we can definitely get, give this a more sophisticated treatment, and I kind of plan on it. But uh, this is uh, this is this is this is a fun little cat version of it. Um, let's see. Oh, and it's consistent with radar measurements made from Arecibo of Phobos and Deimos, which. Uh, shows that they have some of the lowest radar albedos measured in the in the solar system, and therefore the finest grained regolith. Uh, Bush et al. described them as having a thick powdery covering, and that would be consistent with a large amount of infall IDP material. So right now there's two possible origins for Phobos and Deimos that are being discussed. A uh, possible giant impact, which um, you know, the large body struck the moon, you got a short-lived, relatively short-lived ring of debris that condensed and sorted itself into uh, Phobos and Deimos, or they're captured asteroids. And there's different reasons why those two scenarios have been suggested. The giant impact uh, scenario neatly explains the very, the neatly circular and very equatorial orbits of the two moons, which are very hard to, or difficult to explain if they're captured asteroids. Um, but a giant impact does not explain their carbonaceous reflectance spectra because that's completely different than uh, the surface of Mars. Like I point out, it's this carbon dichotomy. There is no carbon on the, on the surface of Mars. How could you get a carbonaceous body from an impact there? Uh, the captured a asteroid theory, um, it makes it it's tricky to explain their current neatly circular equatorial orbits, but it would ex would ex explain their approximate match to carbonaceous asteroids. Um, they put out my co-authors and I did a LPSC abstract last year where we where we where we theorized this uh, or hypothesized this uh, this third option where you did have a giant impact that produced a neatly circular equatorial orbits. But then they, you picked up a mantle of, of carbonaceous infall material uh, to explain the carbonaceous chondrite-like uh, 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 spectrum. There's a few interesting um, implications there. All right, so if Phobos and Deimos have this rubble pile Mars origin interior, 
which would have been uh, 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 devolatilized in the impact, and then it was coated with uh, dust, which is uh, has no ice by, by nature, then all of Phobos and Deimos should not have ice. And I point that out because if you go on the NASA's uh, science uh, 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 director, uh, director at page that defines these bodies to talk about uh, all the ice that could be there on Phobos and Deimos. It's also important if we want to do ISRU there. And also, you, it implies that these things, these bodies should have a very poor mechanical toughness overall. So, summarizing. The, uh, of the dichotomy itself, carbon dichotomy, carbon is not accumulating on the Martian surface. There's very little to be found by the land admissions there. That tells us that the oxidative flux to the atmosphere is occurring faster than the 0.71 on uh, 0.2496 e to the six kilogram per year infall rate. Uh, it also implies that the carbon on the surface, anything found by a rover or lander, should be young. And I point you toward a Frank Sabas paper on that. Um, <coughs> as far as Phobos and Deimos occurred, you know, if Phobos and Deimos are um, uh, captured asteroids after all, and you know the mechanism. You know, the mechanism works where they've wound up with circular orbits, then all of this is a moot point and they are just captured asteroid, uh, carbonaceous asteroid. But if they form, <coughs> excuse me again, if they form from a giant impact, then some manner of carbon addition is necessary to explain their current spectra, and the IDP flux might be enough to do it. Um, also, yeah, I already said this, stick me as young, there's no ice on the moon, and the, uh, JAXA's upcoming MMX sample return mission, honestly, should be a definitive uh, answer to this or uh, other uh, uh, Phobos and Deimos related uh, origins issues. And uh, that's it. I will leave you with this uh, pretty picture of what Mars will look like when Phobos drops below the Roche limit and turns into rings. <laughs> okay. Um, any, any, any questions for Mark at this point? I have some. Unexpected questions. It's what cat talks get you. I think both Rifkin and Peters are typing stuff in. So okay. I'm going to chime in. This is Amanda while they're typing. Ha ha. Okay. Um, let's see. Mihai Haranyi has some models, I don't know if he's got a published paper, but showing that Phobos is largely covered by Deimos dust. Uh-huh, I've seen that. Yeah, um, and so how does that fit in uh, with what you're thinking about? Uh, um, I remember, okay, I remember this paper. It's been a couple of years since I looked at it. Uh, basically, the, the dust coming off of, of Deimos, Deimos, I kind of do it interchangeably, um, should funnel down and, and a good bit of it should wind up on Phobos. Um, that seems like part of the system that seems reasonable to me. Uh, you still have a, a total flux coming from outside that uh, is, I believe, sufficient to cover both of them. So this would be a minor portion of that. So what is the thinking right now on um, exactly how much carbon is on the surfaces of those moons? Um, What's the latest on that? I don't know the latest. Uh, what I was working from was this paper where it basically showed that uh, anything more than 2% and you kind of lose control of uh, putting quantified numbers on it because it, it, it dominates the spectra. And I don't believe you can get numbers you know, if you can discern like five from ten percent beyond that, if anyone has a better handle on that, then please well, chime in. But, but what as far as I know, it's just more than two. Well, um, let, me, let me get to some of the questions that are in the chat box. Okay, okay but okay. I just want to find out what paper Mark was just referring to with the two percent. Okay. I was referring to Heroy and Peters, 1991. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Andy Rifkin asks if the if he understands the scenario correctly, and he is, after all, sort of half type of thing. Uh, should, shouldn't our moon have that much carbon as well? That, I'm sorry? If, if the scenario is correct, shouldn't the moon have that much carbon as well? Um, um, our moon, that, that I've actually spent some time pondering. You know, why is that so? 
And I think it comes down to, for one thing, there's a much lower dust flux for the Earth and Moon than there is for Mars and, and its moons. Uh, there's, uh, depending on the type of comet, I believe three to five times more comets cross uh, Mars's orbit than Earth. And the flux is considerably higher, even though the uh, total uh, the size of Mars cuts down on the on the uh, the smaller size of Mars cuts down on the flux somewhat. Um, you still end up with oh, I don't want to quote numbers. I don't remember the paper. Uh, I can hunt down the paper with numbers in it and and share that though. Uh, I believe the total infall flux for them for for the uh, uh, Mars ends up being. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I get theme music. <laughs> As with the days of our lives, like dust through the hourglass. <laughs> um, uh, also, the infall speed is lower on Mars. Uh, you're closer to the source, and it's a, and it's uh, the gravity well is not as as intense. Uh, so more of the dust should survive uh, the impact gardening uh, after after it lands on the surface. That's a good question. I want to play with the numbers some more. But that's my my first take on it. Uh, can I ask my question? Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is Bill Bodke. I, you know, I, I, your scenario is something I've I've wondered over the years. And I haven't done any serious calculations of this, but but here are some things I keep coming back to that that worry me about it. Um, so the first question is, if you're right, then really we're just dealing with a surface veneer on Phobos and Deimos. Right. So should recent impacts have punctured that veneer and show what's underneath, and that should look very like, different. Yep, like Stickney, and that's exactly what Stickney looks like. It has a different sur uh, reflectance spectra that. Uh, um, that's why I said on there that Stickney may well be young, but basically you've exhumed uh, subsurface material and mixed it with the with the uh, surface rind, and now you have a a different reflectance spectra around Stickney Crater. But over time, it'll be buried and uh, assume the same reflectance spectra as the rest of Phobos. Um, I'll let I'll let Andy comment on that. The, the, the second question, though, I have is that I believe the influx rate on Phobos and Deimos is not terribly different than what you would expect in the asteroids. And yet we see a, a wide variety of spectra in the asteroids. Like for example, Vesta. Um, I don't see any, I don't see why Vesta shouldn't also be covered with carbonaceous chondrate dust. Uh, yet we don't see any evidence that it's buried to the point where we can't tell it's Vesta. So how do you? I mean, how much how much of a difference in flux do you need to have Phobos and Deimos be one way and main belt asteroids be a different way? Um, this kind of comes back to what I was saying with uh, the the unanswered part of uh, the Deimos in particular. The uh, or well, no, either one of them. But uh, none of these calculations take into account a loss by ejection uh, from impact gardening. You know, the dust is going to settle settle softly. It's not going to come barreling in. But then you also have larger rocks that are going to come down and garden the surface, and it will kick some of the material off. And I haven't accounted for that in here, in here and it needs to be done. But the flux, I would believe that the flux for uh, infall flux for Phobos and Deimos is going to be much higher than anything in the asteroid belt because it's sitting down in Mars's gravity well and it's experiencing Mars's infall flux. I, I actually don't think I, it's that I, different, but I'd have to find that number. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can we can play with it and find out. Yeah. Um, can I move on to the next talk? No, yes. not yet. Talk? No. There's another good question. This is Simone Marti from Boulder. Uh, uh, first, a comment about the uh, connection to the moon, our moon. I believe the difference there could be that our moon is farther out from the Earth than potentially Martian satellites are to Mars. And so the talking stream that has been claimed to potentially make a difference could be different. And so that could explain that, perhaps. Uh, but I also want to go back to the interpretation of the spectra and uh, as you pointed out, uh, there's been a suggestion that it could be, you know, a few percent of carbon is <coughs> low. Um, I just want to point out that there was a recent paper that came out, I believe Rone et al. last year, where they basically uh, concluded that instead you could explain that steep slope without any organics whatsoever, you just need to have uh, some sort of fine particles that could uh, condensate 
out of the disk. And so this will be condensation of, uh, you know, vapor uh, in which there is little or no uh, carbon at all, and still you would get a decent uh, spectral match. So, uh, you know, that's just to say what has been said, that we don't really know how much carbon there is on this object. Perhaps that could be known, uh, if you believe this paper. Uh, it would be interesting to look for material like that on Mars' surface as well, because we have a, uh, a rover there in a, a near equatorial uh, location at Gale Crater. It would be, uh, you know, there, there's an avenue, a possible avenue of investigation there. Ready to move on to Tom Prettyman. Um, which is uh, carbon